Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5, looking at 23 and 24. Continuing our thinking about God's faithful promise to us. We read there in the scripture, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. We're going to start with a little bit of review this morning and what we have learned so far. To know the God of peace at work in one's life, one must know the God of peace, right? It is to the God of peace that Paul appeals in this prayer wish. And in order for this to be effective for those to whom it is prayed, they need to know the God of peace. And may the God of peace do this work in your life. It is a change of allegiance, to put it in the words earlier we have seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, in turning to God from idols. Turning to God from idols. To know the transformational character of the message of the gospel, one needs to know the God who is able. He also will bring it to pass. The fundamental change in allegiance that we witness, of which is instigated by God, is essential to having peace with God. Turning to God from idols is the outward view or the human view of conversion. When you see somebody renounce what they, what they were and turn to the living and true God... He is my desire. That's what we talk about when we mean conversion, a turning. But it must never replace the inward view or regeneration by God through the Holy Spirit. Rather, it begins with the inner and is seen in the outer. God is at work in the heart of his people. And we trust him to complete that work. And that's what this, these two verses are all about. As we continue to review, to know the transformational character of the gospel is to know the God who is able. We remain the same, we saw. We remain the same as human beings, fulfilling the cultural mandate to fill, subdue, and rule. However, we are on the road to transformation. We are on the road to to transformation and that transformation takes place primarily in two areas of our lives in terms of knowledge in terms of knowledge from the rejection of God in knowledge to renewal unto true knowledge true knowledge Colossians 3:10 Paul says and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A transformation must take place in our knowledge, but it also must take place in terms of our ethic, of our ethic, from the corruption of the fallen nature to renewal unto God's likeness. It's from what we were or what we are pre-Christ to what we shall become post-meeting Christ. That is, the difference that Christ makes in our lives transforms our knowledge, what we think about, how we think about things, the process of thinking about things, and it also changes our heart in terms of our character. From a fallen nature, embracing sin, loving sin, loving those things that God hates, to hating those things that God hates and loving the things that God loves. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind 
and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That is righteousness and holiness that belongs to the truth. Therefore, true righteousness, true holiness. And it's important to emphasize that we are passive participants in this. That is, it is God who is at work in us, as we saw last time. It is God at work in us, renewing us, recreating us. Now, we may never reach that ultimate goal in this life, right? We press on. Paul says himself, we press on. Toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Even Paul was saying that he wanted to mature. Even Paul was saying he wanted to press on. And if the Apostle Paul is saying that, we say that as well. To the point that in that day we see the, full, the fullness of the transformation and renewal of our lives. And not just our lives, but of all things. Of all things. To know the transformational character of the gospel is to know the God who is able. So we, as those who are at peace with God and who have turned to God from idols, we are exhorted to walk and please God, which results in your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 3, we looked at that earlier in our series. And if we were to glance back at it, Paul is exhorting the church as he has dealt with some of the practical matters or some of the, the uh, matters concerning ministry and ministering to them and, and how he desired to be with them again and so forth. Now he's He's laying on them some more practical things. And he says, finally then, brethren, we, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk, and remember, the word ought there is necessary. It's an interesting word, little word, but it means it is necessary. As to how it is necessary for you to walk and please God. Right? And that's what it's all about. That's what sanctification, being set apart more unto God and apart from the world. Moving in a direction toward who our God is. To walk and please God. And he acknowledges that they are doing so. Just as you actually do walk. That you excel still more. Skipping to verse 3. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification. Your sanctification. And remember then, we talked about, at some length, <clears throat> about pursuing excellence. Pursuing excellence in the Christian walk. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean humanistic perfectionism. It doesn't mean what other people think, th how things should be transpiring. It is how God thinks it should be. It is the transformation of your life, falling in love with Him more, trusting Him more, growing in faith, <clears throat> in hope, in love, loving Him more, loving your neighbor more, pursuing excellence, pursuing excellence. The end of verse 1 of chapter 4, that you excel still more, that you abound in walking and pleasing God, that you pursue excellence in life. And then we asked, what is the measure of excellence? You see, it isn't, you know, and I just said it, but I'm going to emphasize it. It isn't a human standard. It isn't what, what someone else thinks you ought to be doing. It's what? It's what? Well, it's right here. It is God's word. It is God's word. It is the commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. That is what is at stake. That is what is at stake. <clears throat> Again, opinions are nice. Wisdom is good. But it has to be founded upon the word of God. 
And if you have something explicitly stated in the word of God that says, this is how I want you to walk. This is how you please me. It is therein that you walk. It is therein that you seek. And it is found, as Paul said earlier to us, it is found in the commandments that they gave by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And we're not going to take the time to unpack it. We already did that. But it's, but it's something that we must emphasize in terms of what we're thinking about related to sanctification. And it's in conjunction with that and it's in doing that uh, that God is at work. And we're going to elaborate upon that a little more. But we're going to put it together now here. Beginning to put it, put it together, putting it together, you are called upon to walk and please God and to excel still more. That is to pursue excellence in life, to be sanctified more and more, set apart to God from the influence of the world. The influence of the world. Romans 12, 1 and, 1 and 2. Very key passage in the book of Romans in terms of what Paul had just laid out in terms of doctrine, in terms of the fundamentals. Therefore, therefore, he can say, because of everything that I have taught you, everything that I have expressed in chapters 1 through 11, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And note well that it begins with worship. It begins with worship. It is not through moralistic self-effort. Paul, if we're thinking about Romans, Paul did not write chapters 1 through 11 only to turn around and say, now engage in self-effort and try to do your best. No, it's because of what Jesus has done. It is because of these things, these great truths that I have written to you. Now do this. It begins with worship, beloved. It begins with worship. I said then and I say again now. If you feel your life getting out of kilter a little bit, check your worship. Who are you worshiping? Who are you serving? You need to come face to face with that question every day, really, of your lives. Who will I worship today? Who will I serve today? The God who is at work in me, who promised me all these things in Jesus, or myself, or something else. Who will I worship? Who will I worship? But it begins with worship and it continues through a renewal of your mind. A renewal of your mind, a mind that is renewed. And we can actively take part in that in terms of the scripture and understanding them and studying them, reading them. Asking questions, finding the answers there, but remembering always that it is also a passive endeavor. That is, God is at work renewing us. God is at work renewing us. And it is a great and glorious truth. Right? To be sanctified more and more, set apart to God from the influence of the world, not through moralistic self-effort. The world is going to attack you and try to, as it's paraphrased in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, to squeeze you into its mold. You resist that. And you are more and more set apart to God from the influence of the world not through self-effort, but in hope of the promise of the faithfulness of God. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Beloved, what a word of encouragement. For all that we are called to do as believers in following him and believing in him and, and pursuing excellence and all of these things, it is for not unless God is at work. 
And Paul says he is at work. Now may the God of peace himself do this for you. Not so that you check out of life, not so that you stop doing what you're doing, but that you lean hard on him, knowing that he is sovereignly working in your heart and life. What a great and glorious truth, beloved. It's just magnificent. It is magnificent. And this brings us into the sphere of the sovereign activity of the living and true God toward his people. Beloved, God has said that he would do some things. And he is at work doing it. And Paul can write this prayer wish out knowing full well that it is God who has promised and God who is faithful to do. Faithful. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Entirely. Do you see something in your life you don't like? Well, if you're like me, and you are, we're human beings, you do. You do see things in your life you still don't like, depending on where you are. You still don't like certain things. The hope of the promise is that God is at work and he will never stop. He will never give up. Part of my praying, a little personal here, but part of my praying is, Lord, don't let me give up on you and please don't give up on me. Part of that comes from knowing who God is. It's not that I question who he is. Sometimes I question myself. Sometimes you might question yourself. But when it's rooted in who God is, when it's anchored there, there's no greater place to be. There's no greater place to be. So, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Here also Paul points to the source and goal of the Christian's desire to become all that our God desires of us to be. Let my desires be your, or let you, your desires that you have for me become my desires, O Lord. Make it a prayer. Here also Paul points to everything that we could hope for and pray for concerning each other. You having trouble praying, knowing how to pray for somebody? Right here it is. Right here it is. May the God of peace himself sanctify and just start down the list. Grace, Adonis, Sylvia, Alan, Joan, Leanne, Jean, Amy. Dia, Rachel, Lisa, sorry you guys, I'm not going to go through the whole list. You know what I mean? It is really wrestling in prayer, Lord, this is what you say. And I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to believe it for my sphere of influence, for the people whom you have put in, in my life. I want you at work in their lives transforming them into the image of Christ, that they might know you more, love you more, and love, our, love themselves less. What a prayer. What a, what a way to really be praying for each other. And the appeal, beloved, the appeal is to the transforming grace and power of God. Last time I checked, the last time might sound a little weird. The last time I checked the scriptures or read the scriptures, uh, God, when he sends his word forth, <clears throat> it does not return to him void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. That is fantastic, beloved. Because like I said, as much as you would like things in a person's life to be a certain way, and you'd like to be, we kid each other at home, who's the puppet master? We're not. We're not the puppet master. But God is sovereign. 
And the more I see that I can't do, and the more you see that you can't do, use that to spur you on to appeal to God more and more for the lives of those around you. Because there's nothing like the power of God and His transforming grace. It is a wonderful thing, beloved. There is not, there is not a single area of our lives that will be left done, undone by our Lord's transformational redeeming power in the end. Not a single area. This is our prayer. This is our hope. Our prayer and hope is that, you know, I will not be the same person I was then that I will be in that day. And neither will you. I'm going to mention it here but I, uh, in a little bit, but I want to mention it again. Um, notice the last phrase in verse 23. And like I said, I'm going to be mentioning it here in a minute, but I just think it's thrilling. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a single area will be left undone. One way theologians speak of certain matters in terms of sin and its influence in our lives as Christians, as believers, we are, I got to get this right, we are able not to sin. Before Christ, we were not able not to sin. We had to sin. In Christ, we are able not to sin. And in that day, we won't be able to sin. Can you imagine? And that won't look anything like the world thinks it should look. It'll look exactly the way God had planned it to be all along. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The confidence in our hope for change and praying rests then in God himself. That God will reach his goal. God will reach his goal. Sanctify you entirely. Sanctify you entirely. That God's people will be totally transformed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing will be left undone. That we will have a fully transformed, redeemed character in true, unto true righteousness and true holiness with, with the full production of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives called the fruit of the Spirit. Anybody remember those fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's right. Remember, not through a moralistic endeavor or self-effort, but through God's sovereign grace. Taking the accomplishment of Christ and through the Holy Spirit, applying the full force of redemption in us in renewal and recreation unto true knowledge, true holiness, and true righteousness. We approach the table of the Lord. With this good hope. We continue to come to the table. Remembering what he has done. But it is unto something. Until he comes again. We proclaim the Lord's death. The transforming, uh, transformational power and grace of God. In the death of Christ. Until that day when he comes again. When all things will be made new. So let's tie it back with what we saw in chapter 4 verses 1 through 12. When we visited there. How do we excel in the Christian walk and please God? How do we excel in becoming more of what God wants us to be? How do we excel in love? 
toward fellow believers and those outside the faith, we do so not in ourselves, but because of what Jesus has accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection as it is applied to our lives through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word to us and all that it means. Thank you for meeting with us here today. For the word of your power, the transforming power of your word that is part of our lives. And Father, we ask that you would continue that sovereign work of grace and power in our lives till the day that Jesus comes again, or you call us home. And we pray, Father, that the church would continue to advance as you are at work sanctifying your people, setting us apart in true knowledge and true righteousness and true holiness, confronting a lost and dying world that looks the world over for its answers and finds none, yet rests in a rock that is not like our rock. And so, Lord, uphold us, strengthen us, help us, and continue in us that work which you have begun in Jesus. And now the Holy Spirit is applying that to our lives, and may you continue to do so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.